Social media star Gabby Petito captured national spotlight when she was reported missing in early September. Now the authorities are involved. As you are aware, FBI personnel and Jackson Police Department have been conducting an investigative activity. Her fiance knows her last whereabouts, but refuses to cooperate with officials. We're just pleading with him at this point to please speak with us. Do you think it's okay to leave a, a, a young 22-year-old person in the middle of nowhere? My friend's life is at stake. He saw her last. I just wish he'd say something. As more information comes out, Grand County Sheriff's Office. I'd like to report a domestic dispute. The gut feeling's my fear. The situation gets darker and darker. Did your parents help you clean it? Did they, did they help cover up a crime? We believe you know the location of where Brian left Gabby. You guys have blood on your hands too. You have blood on your hands. People have shared their tips on social media, trying to crack the case. We saw, not only saw, but saw like a blowout of a situation between Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, Reality star Dog the Bounty Hunter is using his expertise to help. Because I lost a daughter at about the same age, that's, I know what the parents feel like, okay? And you want justification. You want the guy behind bars. The couple was stopped by police before Gabby's disappearance. Let's go ahead and take a seat. Let's go ahead and get you to step out of the vehicle. Did we miss the red flags? He comes across charming, controlling. This guy comes across smooth. Were there hidden messages in Brian's social media posts? The opposite of lost. Don't try to find me. It was recently discovered that Brian booked a flight in the midst of his fight with Gabby. Brian was recently found, but the situation has many people enraged. Some people believe something sinister was going on behind the scenes. This shit was staged. Who believes that Brian Laundrie's dad planted the new found evidence? What happened between the couple? Why was Brian on the run? Here's what we know so far. Twenty-two-year-old Gabby Petito was known as a travel influencer who lived the van life with her 24-year-old fiancé, Brian Laundrie. The couple documented their journey on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Hello, hello, and good morning. Their YouTube career started in August, and their first video got over 4 million views. In the description box of their video, the couple explained they had taken a cross-country trip before starting their channel, and when they came back, they decided they wanted to travel full-time. During their first trip, they traveled in a compact car and stayed in Airbnbs, but realized it was expensive, so they decided to handcraft their own tiny van and downsize their lifestyle to continue traveling and living nomadically. We've been lucky so far at all the places we've stayed, but I'd say this is one of the best so far. They seemed like the perfect couple, sharing romantic montages and showing how they lived on the road. But things took a very sinister turn when Brian cut their cross-country trip short and returned home without Gabby. Since then, many people have come forward to help with the case. Here's what we know so far. Last year, on July 2nd, 2020, Gabby announced her engagement to Brian on Instagram. <laughs> On December 11th, 2020, Brian announced on Instagram they purchased a white 2021 Ford Transit van for new adventures. Exactly a year after their engagement, on July 2nd, 2021, Gabby and Brian left New York for a planned four-month cross-country trip using their van, according to Gabby's stepfather, Jim Schmidt. Gabby's family's attorney, Richard Stafford, said the pair postponed their wedding plans because of the pandemic and decided to go on a trip instead. According to their social media posts, Gabby and Brian traveled from Florida to Kansas, Colorado, and Utah to sightsee and camp at several national attractions but things turned sour during their second month on the trip. On August 12th, two different people called Moab police to report a domestic dispute between Gabby and Brian. One caller witnessed the male being hostile to the female on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower. Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was in the girl. And then we stopped, they ran up and down the sidewalk, he proceeded to hear, hopped in the car, and they drove off. A second caller said he also witnessed the couple fighting. His conversation was recorded on one of the officer's body cams. They were sort of squabbling over a phone. I want to say that he was trying to grab her phone, and then it seemed like uh, he had sort of walked to one side of the van and sort of wasn't letting her in. And, and then the male was stepping into the driver's seat, and he said something about why you're being so mean. I remember he sort of him 
um, a few times, and it wasn't like two bugs in the face, but just kind of like, like kind of like two kids kind of fighting. But there seemed like something was off, and like a weird vibe. Eventually, he crawled into the driver's seat, sort of like got into the vehicle over his lap, um, sort of first her way again, I guess. The caller said the couple drove off afterwards. Moab officers Eric Pratt and Daniel Scott Robbins took on the case and managed to pull over Gabby and Brian near the entrance to Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. The officer's body cam footage has since been released to the public. Here's a glimpse at what happened. Gabby was seen emotional and crying throughout most of the police encounter, while Brian remained calm and collected. The pair were questioned separately to hear each side of their story. Officer Robbins commented on the couple's van swerving as they pulled over. Brian claimed Gabby grabbed the wheel while they tried to pull over, but Gabby responded differently. I did it because it was near real, but only, only, only for like a second because I just saw the lights come on and it was more just like you're an idiot. Like, you know. But did you grab the steering wheel and like no. swerve or anything like no, that? I don't know. Both Gabby and Brian share a similar explanation of getting in a minor scuffle when Brian climbed into the van with dirty feet. Gabby said she has OCD, implying she wanted to keep the van clean. Brian added there were a lot of little things building over the last few days, but didn't clarify what these things were. Brian said while they were arguing near Moonflower, he suggested they go for a walk separately to calm down. Brian said when he got back in the van, Gabby thought he was going to leave her without a ride, so she started to swing at him. Brian pushed her away to avoid this, but she still made minor marks on Brian. Gabby admitted to striking Brian when she thought he was going to leave her in Moab. Although Brian wanted her to take a breather and calm down, Gabby said she's normally calm and Brian was stressing her out. She said Brian didn't believe in her new career. I'm sorry if I'm in a bad mood. I've just been really stressed. I had so much work I was doing on my computer this morning. What do you do for a living? Just um, in my job to travel across the country and I'm trying to start a blog. I okay. have a blog and stuff. So I've been building my website. So I've been really stressed. And I didn't really believe that I could do any of it, so that's kind of been like a, I don't know, he's like a downer. Officer Pratt also questioned Gabby about her actions and pointed out the injuries she had. Kind of looks like something like you in the face. I don't know. And then over on your arm, um, your shoulder, right here. There's, that's new, huh? It's kind of a new mark. Oh um, yeah, I don't know. Can I see the other side of your face? So, what happened here and here? Um, I, I'm not sure it was a... First name, I was just trying to get in the back of the car and his back was on the back. And back. Got me. When Pratt said two independent witnesses by Moonflower saw Brian and Gabby's altercation, she took the blame. Well, to be honest, I definitely first. Um, Where'd you hit him? I s You s him first? And then what, just on his face? He just kind of shut up. How many times did you s him? Romeo, India, Alpha. Pratt asked what Brian's reaction was. Pratt further questioned if Brian laid hands on Gabby, and she said he did. I guess, yeah, but I first. Where did he hit you? Don't, don't worry, just well, be honest. Like, my face, like, I guess. Uh -huh. um, he didn't like me in the face. He like, like with his nail, and I guess that's why it looks. I definitely have a cut right here, but I can feel it. Yeah. Like, touch it, it burns. Pratt told Brian that Gabby would have to be cited for domestic battery because he and Gabby made it clear she was the primary aggressor. So at this point you're the victim of a domestic assault. Brian laughed at the idea of being a victim. <laughs> Gabby was given a court date to determine if she would be charged and Brian would be allowed to pursue the charges. Brian expressed his concern and love for Gabby despite their altercation. I'm not going to pursue anything. My fiance, I love her, it's just a little squabble. I'm sorry that I had to get so public. Pratt said he wouldn't put Gabby in jail, but a no-contact order was immediately in effect, meaning the pair could not text, call, and occupy any premise together, including vehicles. If they break the order, then Gabby would face the consequences alone, getting a new charge for violating the order. However, Pratt told Brian he could drop the order by filling out a waiver at the police department the next morning during opening hours. At that point, the pair would be able to see each other again. But Pratt said if the pair don't separate for the night, then Gabby would have to go to jail. Pratt tried to comfort Gabby and told her things would get better with experience. I have a daughter almost your age, and I'm looking at you not so much like a suspect, but also as kind of a victim in the sense that you're dealing with 
some struggles emotionally and mentally at your age. Probably they'll work themselves out as you get older. I think you would have done better if you had the skills to do better. Then, Pratt told Gabby she would be charged and explained how Utah's new law on domestic assault prevents the police from helping them even if the situation appeared to be minor. They don't trust the police to make good decisions because too many cops have made bad decisions. So they say, we're not going to give you discretion. It doesn't even matter if they barely hurt at all and the guy doesn't want to press charges. We don't have a choice. When Pratt told Gabby she would have to make a court appearance, she begged him to help her. Court now. I have a ticket for hitting the curb and <laughs> something, please, because we're okay. When Pratt told Gabby about the no contact order, she was in tears and told Pratt she didn't want to be separated for the night because of her anxiety. Pratt called his supervisor to see if there was anything they could do, but his supervisor was also unsure because of Utah's strict law. Pratt reread the Utah law and realized a would apply if there was intention to cause bodily injury. With this new knowledge, Pratt questioned Gabby about her intention. Were you attempting to cause him physical pain or physical impairment? Was that what you were attempting to do to him? No. What were no, you? I was trying to get him to stop telling him to Since Gabby said she didn't mean to harm Brian, the officers decided they would incite her. So I'm choosing not to cite you today. Robbins added it would be a major pain in the butt in her life because she's so young. The officers told Gabby to take the van for the night and Safe Haven, a victim's advocacy group, would find Brian a hotel for the night since he didn't have a place to go, was low on money, and was a victim of Gabby's aggression. Before they separated for the night, Robbins asked Gabby if she had anything to say to Brian. Do you want me to say anything to him? Do you want me to let him know that you love him and that you'll see him tomorrow and stuff like that? I can do that for you. During Brian's ride to the hotel, Robbins brought his personal feelings and experience into the situation. She seems a lot like my wife, and things that really works for my wife is when she gets stressed out to go take a long hot shower, so I gave her a place to go. My wife has really, really bad, bad anxiety, and she takes medication for it daily, and sometimes it's just not enough. Sometimes it builds up and it, it happens. When my wife got put on the medication, within a week, I saw a complete turnaround. I mean, she wasn't nearly as aggressive or angry or anything like that. According to the police report, Robbins and Pratt said the incident was more accurately categorized as a mental emotional health break and a mental health crisis. Criminal profiler Laura Richards spoke with 60 Minutes Australia about her suspicions surrounding Brian's behavior in the police footage. Brian was not the victim. Everything I'm seeing about Gabby's behavior and demeanor was that she was the true victim. My instinct about what I was seeing on camera was, this is bad news. This is not going to end well. When the police pulled the van over, he sees Gabby very distressed. She's crying. She's almost hyperventilating. Why was she so distressed? The fact that she takes responsibility immediately, her disposition and demeanor of almost walking on eggshells, not wanting him to get into trouble, they're red flags to me. She also said another red flag was how Brian was lighthearted and calm when approached by police and blamed Gabby immediately. This was one human being behaving in a way that was insidious, controlling, and manipulative, if not just to his partner, but to the police officers. And he clearly lied to the police officers and they believed everything that he said. That makes me angry. Also on August 12th, Gabby posted two photo sets on Instagram. The captions provided specific times, mentioned multiple people who had seen them, and shared how dangerous rock climbing was for them. People said the captions were edited, and many believe Brian was the one behind the lengthy posts. Many people also believe Brian may have been trying to set up a story. If this caption doesn't scream alibi, I don't know what does. He wrote this it states, many people who spotted us. Weird. This is so suspect and not right. This whole post seems like a subconscious confession on his behalf, creating a narrative that he can link to on the future. Almost seems like some foreshadowing for him to hide behind an accidental slip and fall. Sounds like someone's trying hard to be convincing she was seen alive and well and her whereabouts. So specific, like, we were definitely at this place at this time. And in other posts, we're super experienced hikers, so we tried dangerous stuff. On August 19th, a photo of the pair sitting in the white van was posted to Gabby's Instagram. However, people believe the photo was posted by Brian. The caption spoke about respecting national parks and living plastic free, things Gabby doesn't normally post about. But Brian has posted about keeping plastic off the trails before on his Instagram account. People noticed she did not have her location tagged in the photo, but every other photo has a tag. Someone also noticed the photo was not taken recently. The same photo was posted on August 2nd to her Instagram story and was saved to her story highlights. On August 17th, Brian took a flight back to his parents' Florida home. A week later, on August 23rd, 
Brian flew back to Salt Lake City to rejoin Gabby. According to the Laundry family attorney, Brian went to Florida to get some supplies and close a storage unit to save money. The couple was thinking about extending their road trip. On August 24th, Gabby FaceTimed her mom and told her she was leaving Utah and heading to the Teton Range in Wyoming, according to the Petito family's attorney. On August 25th, Gabby exchanged multiple texts with her mom. Her family believes she was at the Teton Range by this day, according to their family attorney. Also on August 25th, the last photo of Gabby was posted to her Instagram, where she is seen standing in front of a butterfly mural holding a knit pumpkin. The caption said, Happy Halloween, along with the fly and pumpkin emoji. Her location was also not tagged in this photo. People noticed other concerning things in the post. This post doesn't add up. They were traveling across the country visiting state parks, then all of a sudden a post where they are back in civilization with a generic description. This was not posted by Gabby. I find it a little odd that this was her last post to date, and she didn't put hashtags on it, but there are hashtags on every other post of hers. Anyone else bothered by the fly beside the pumpkin after the happy Halloween? Her hair looks freshly dyed here. In her hiking pics, she has more roots. This may have been an old picture posted. In fact, in a post from July 26th, you can see Gabby's brown roots growing out. On August 26th, witness Hunter Mannies claimed he encountered Brian drinking alone at the Bullwinkles restaurant in West Yellowstone, Montana. Hunter told Inside Edition Brian appeared sulking, mad, or in deep thought, and Brian was aggressive when he spoke. Also on August 26th, van dweller Jessica Schultz spotted Brian parking a white van in the Spread Creek at 8.10 p.m. He was very kind of awkward and confused, and it was just him. There was no Gabby, unless she was in the back somewhere. Jessica said the van was not parked in a designated spot. The Spread Creek area is a bunch of designated camping spots and you're not supposed to camp outside those designated spots and this van was not in a real spot. On August 27th, more texts were exchanged between Gabby and her mom, according to their family attorney. Also on August 27th, full-time RVers Jen Bethune and her husband Kyle Bethune claimed they saw Gabby's white van parked in Spread Creek Dispersed Campground at around 6 to 6.30 p.m. They uploaded their dash cam footage to YouTube showing the moment they passed by the white vehicle. Jen said they noticed the van's Florida license plate and wanted to approach them. We were going to stop and say hi because we're from Florida too, but the van was completely dark. There was nobody there, so we decided to continue on our way. The white van was captured from another angle as Kyle was driving, showing a sombrero hat on the dashboard and what appears to be a pillow in the driver's seat. YouTuber Nerve Gorilla also pointed out how one of the back doors of Gabby's van appeared to be open, but the door closed as Kyle drove closer. You're gonna see it and closed. Now, if you think it's a tree, I'll just let it play a little bit here and you'll see that's not actually a tree. You'll see there's no tree in the center. A pair of flip-flops can also be seen on the ground near the back doors of the van. Also on August 27th, Nina Seely Angelo and Matthew England, a couple from New Orleans, said they witnessed Gabby and Brian having a blowout fight at Mary Piglet's Mexican Grill in Jackson, Wyoming at around 1 p.m. The restaurant is about four to five miles away from the Teton area. In a now-deleted Instagram story, Nina explained they were sitting right next to Gabby and Brian during the blowout fight. They were fighting with the hostess. She was hysterically crying. And she walked out and she she was crying and she was staying on the sidewalk and I was watching the whole thing unfold. And I don't even know if they got kicked out, but they like left abruptly and like she was standing on the sidewalk crying and he walked back in and was like screaming at the hostess and then walked back out and then he walked back in like four more times to talk to the manager and to like tell the hostess off. And Nina said Gabby was crying and seemed genuinely sad, while Brian seemed angry and relentless. Nina said she suspected this may have been the last time Gabby was alive. Nina said she and Matthew have already told authorities what they saw. The manager of Mary Piglet's claimed he saw Gabby and Brian arrive at the diner on foot and without the van. Jessica, who saw Brian a day before, said the white van was still parked in the same undesignated spot at Spread Creek Dispersed Campground from August 27th to 29th. I figured they'd get booted by the people that patrol the area. But the van was there for several days and nights and it did not get booted. She said she was camping with a group of friends in the last two weeks of August and they all saw the white van. Jessica also described the atmosphere around the white van. The 
weirdest part about it was, was that there was no indication that there was anybody actually at the van. Um, usually small van people have their doors open, they're outside, they have a hammock, a, something, but we didn't see any signs of actual life at the van. Also on August 29th, a Wisconsin college student named Miranda Baker claimed she and her boyfriend picked up Brian while he was hitchhiking that evening at 5.44 p.m. Miranda said Brian approached them outside the showers at Coulter Bay, Wyoming, which is located in the northern part of Grand Teton National Park. Miranda and her boyfriend said they were heading to Jackson and Brian offered $200 to come along. This struck Miranda as kind of weird because the ride to Jackson would have been approximately 10 miles. During the car ride, Brian was reportedly calm and nice, but when Miranda clarified they were going to Jackson Hole, Brian allegedly got agitated and asked to get out of the vehicle. Instead, Brian was dropped off near Jackson Lake Dam, Wyoming at 6.09 p.m. According to Jackson Hole Chamber, a trip planner site, Jackson Hole is a valley about 80 miles long and 15 miles wide. Jackson is a major town within the valley. It's unclear where Brian actually wanted to go. However, it is worth mentioning there's another Jackson located in New Hampshire. This would have taken a day and a half of nonstop driving driving to reach. When Brian was in the car, Miranda shared details from their conversation. He said he was hiking along Snake River, which is up here and it kind of like goes down a little bit. Um, and he said he was gone for multiple days and he had left his fiance, never called her by her name, back at their campsite, which they, he said they camped in a dispersed campsite, so it's not a regulated um, campsite and he was gone for multiple days without her and he was sleeping on a tarp. A Northport police spokesperson said, Miranda's account is plausible, it appears. Jessica, who saw Brian park the van for several days straight at Spread Creek, suspects Brian may have asked Miranda to drop him off earlier than expected because of the route. When Miranda Baker picked up hitchhiker Brian Laundrie here at Coulter Bay, he asked to go to Jackson, right? And Jackson is south, but, when he, I think what he realized was that when they turned here to go to Jackson, which you can get to Jackson, that takes you back through the park, um, he probably assumed they were going to go this way, which is the bigger route, right? And Spread Creek, where we saw the van up until the 29th, was, you know, right in this area. So I think he was trying to get back to this area and was like, oh, no, this, this isn't going to get me where I need to go. Back to Miranda's account. Miranda also recalled Brian saying he would continue hitchhiking and find another ride. Around 6 to 11 minutes after Miranda dropped him off at Jackson Lake Dam, another woman picked him up at 6.15 or 6.20 p.m. 23-year-old Norma Jean Kalavec said she realized she also picked up Brian on August 29th after seeing Miranda's TikTok videos. Norma said she attended mass at a church around 1.2 miles from Jackson Lake Dam. She spotted Brian walking backwards holding his thumb out. Norma said Brian asked if she was going to Jackson and she said no because she lives in the opposite direction. Instead, Brian reportedly asked her to drop him off at the Spread Creek Dispersed Campground, about 10 miles from the dam. Norma agreed and they reached Spread Creek around 6.30 or 6.40 p.m. Norma said she already shared her encounter with the FBI. On August 30th, Gabby's family received their last text from Gabby, which read, no service in Yosemite. About a week prior, Gabby said she would be in the Teton area. Teton is approximately 800 miles away from Yosemite. The Petito family attorney said her parents doubt Gabby was in Yosemite or that she sent that final text message. On August 31st, Laundrie's mother canceled a camping trip for two to Fort DeSoto campsite for September 1st to the 3rd. On September 1st, Brian returned alone to his parents' home in Northport, Florida, where Brian and Gabby also live, according to police. According to the affidavit on a search warrant request, a license plate reader showed Gabby's van exited Interstate 75 to Northport at 10.26 a.m. Then, Northport police released these images of Gabby's van, which they found at the laundry home. The police believe Brian drove the vehicle back to Northport. Josh Taylor, a Northport police spokesperson, said the police processed the vehicle with the FBI and there was some material in there that we'll be going through. Some strange things to note are the white van belonged to Gabby, but Brian drove it home without her. Gabby was engaged to Brian and lived in Brian's family home for a year. Also on September 1st, Brian's sister, Cassie Laundrie, said her parents, Christopher and Roberta Laundrie, picked up her kids at school and planned to hang out. She didn't realize Brian was with them. Brian and their parents arrived 
arrived at Cassie's house in the family Mustang, not Gabby's van, according to News Nation. Cassie claimed she didn't realize Brian returned without Gabby. On September 4th, Brian opened an account with AT&T on a newly purchased phone, according to the Laundry family's attorney, Stephen Bertolino. On September 6th, Brian and his parents went to Fort DeSoto Campground in Pinellas County, Florida, according to county officials. This is located around 70 miles from their home. Brian's mother checked in at a waterfront site at the campground from September 6th to 8th, according to a Pinellas County Parks campground check-in report provided to ABC Action News. The laundry attorney told CNN the laundry family was at the campground from September 6th and left together on September 7th. Someone who used to work at Civic Plus, which manages the campground reservation system, believed Brian's parents knew Brian was coming early and canceled their trip for two to include him. The FBI have seized surveillance footage from Fort DeSoto Campground. In a later interview with News Nation, Cassie confirmed she was at the Fort DeSoto trip for six hours on September 6th. She explained she met them at the campsite and they had s'mores and dinner before she left that evening. Cassie said no one spoke about Gabby and she had no reason to be suspicious at the time. On September 10th, Karen Aberts, the laundry's neighbor, said she saw Brian at the family home. They went for a walk in the neighborhood. That yeah. was about all I saw. Between September 10th and 11th, police were called into the laundry home a total of five times. The report said problem settled. One of the calls was made by Joe Petito, Gabby's father, who lives in Vero Beach, Florida. On September 11th, Gabby's family still couldn't get in touch with their daughter. Gabby's mother and stepfather, who live in New York, officially reported her missing to police in Suffolk County, New York. That night, Northport authorities went to the laundry home and asked to speak to Brian and his family, but they refused. Josh Taylor, the police spokesperson, said, we were essentially handed the information for their attorney. That is the extent of our conversation with them. Also on September 11th, Cassie said police began questioning her family. This was when she realized something was wrong. On September 13th, those monitoring the laundry home said they allegedly saw Brian leave his home in a Mustang, according to a report from Wink News. On September 14th, the laundry family issued a statement through their attorney about Gabby's disappearance. Their statement read, this is an extremely difficult time for both the Petito family and the laundry family. I understand that a search has been organized for Miss Petito in or near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. On behalf of the Laundry family, it is our hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family. On the advice of counsel, the Laundry family is remaining in the background at this juncture and will have no further comment. Also on September 14th, Brian left his newly purchased phone at home, according to the Laundry attorney. At the same time, he told his parents he was going to hike at the Carlton Reserve, which is 13 miles from their home. On September 15th, those monitoring the Laundry home said they allegedly saw Brian return home with the Mustang. However, police later acknowledged they were mistaken. The person who came back was Laundry's mother, Roberta, who was wearing a baseball cap. The officer said they're kind of built similarly. On September 16th, a news briefing took place. The Petito family attorney read a letter from Gabby's family, begging Brian's family for help. Please, if you or your family have any decency left, please tell us where Gabby is located. Tell us if we are even looking in the right place. All we want is for Gabby to come home. Please help us make that happen. On September 17th, Brian's parents asked police to come to their home, where they claimed they haven't seen Brian since September 14th. As we know, September 14th was the day Brian allegedly left to hike at the Carlton Reserve. The Laundry family attorney told CNN, The whereabouts of Brian Laundry are currently unknown. As of now, the FBI is looking for both Gabby and Brian. Local and federal authorities started a search for Brian as well. Also on September 17th, Cassie told Good Morning America she hasn't heard from Brian since the news of Gabby's disappearance. Appearance. On September 18th, Northport police said authorities were conducting a search for Brian at the Carlton Reserve in Venice, Florida, which has more than 80 miles of hiking trails. At the same time, the FBI and its partners also conducted ground surveys in Grand Teton National Park, the location Gabby last had communication with her family. On September 19th, things took a very sad turn. FBI agent Charles Jones released a statement about the case. Earlier today, human remains were discovered consistent with the description of Gabrielle Gabby Petito. The remains were found in Bridger Teton National Forest, which can be accessed through Spread Creek. As we know, the couple's white van was parked at Spread Creek on August 26th to 29th. It's unclear if Brian was directly involved in Gabby's passing. Later that day, a rainbow appeared near the location where authorities discovered Gabby's remains in Wyoming. Another rainbow appeared over the laundry house in Florida. 
On September 20th, the FBI entered Brian's home to question his parents and search the home, according to police spokesperson Josh Taylor. On September 21st, the Teton County Coroner confirmed the human remains found in Bridger Teton National Forest belonged to Gabby Petito. The FBI said the coroner's initial suspicion about Gabby's manner of death is homicide. However, the cause of death remains pending final autopsy results. That morning, a rainbow appeared at the office of the Teton County Coroner. Later that night, a double rainbow appeared at the Carlton Reserve in Florida, where authorities were searching for Brian. On September 22nd, the FBI announced the U.S. District Court of Wyoming issued a federal arrest warrant for Brian. The warrant was issued because Brian violated federal statute 18 U.S.C. and 1029-A1, use of unauthorized access devices. According to the indictment, Brian allegedly used a debit card and PIN for accounts that don't belonged to him for charges of $1,000 or more during August 30th to September 1st. As you may recall, August 30th was the day Gabby's parents received the no service in Yosemite text from her phone, and September 1st was the day Brian returned alone to his home in Florida with Gabby's van. The indictment does not specify if the bank cards belong to Gabby. The FBI news release stated, while this warrant allows law enforcement to arrest Mr. Laundry, the FBI and our partners across the country continue to investigate the facts and circumstances of Miss Petito's homicide. The money trail gave police clues to continue searching the Carlton Reserve. The double rainbow continued to shine along the Carlton Reserve during this time. Also on September 22nd, Charlene and William Guthrie, who live across the street from the laundries, shared what they witnessed with Fox News. William said he noticed Brian's parents got a new camper for the back of their pickup truck. William said he saw the family loading the camper before they headed out for a trip. They couldn't recall which days they left for, but claimed it was a week or a week and a half after Brian returned home on September 1st. If we go back in the timeline, it's likely the Laundry family took the camper to their Fort DeSoto trip for September 6th to 7th. The neighbors shared their feelings about the trip. Parents going on a trip, I can see that, but taking their 23-year-old son in a small camper that's on the back of the truck struck us as odd. On September 24th, the FBI entered the laundry home to retrieve Brian's personal items to help with DNA matching, according to the laundry family attorney. On September 25th, Dog the Bounty Hunter, a former reality TV star and bail enforcement agent, joined the search for Brian. He tried to speak with Brian's parents, but they did not open the door. Dog told Fox 13 Tampa Bay that Brian's parents can still reach out to him. And the dad can still reach out to me through social media. Let's get the kid captured alive. You may remember that earlier in the timeline, Brian and his parents were seen at Fort DeSoto Park from September 6th to 7th. Well, on September 25th, Dog the Bounty Hunter received a tip about this incident. Dog said there are a lot of small islands surrounding the Fort DeSoto Park that can be accessed by canoe. He later shared a video from waist deep in the water. On September 26th, a funeral was held for Gabby in Holbrook, New York. Her family launched a nonprofit foundation to help other parents find their missing children. On September 26th, 27th, the Laundry family released a statement through their attorney. Chris and Roberta Laundry do not know where Brian is. They are concerned about Brian and hope the FBI can locate him. The speculation by the public and some in the press that the parents assisted Brian in leaving the family home or in avoiding arrest on a warrant that was issued after Brian had already been missing for several days is just wrong. Also on September 27th, the FBI was seen entering the Laundry home again and leaving shortly after holding brown paper bags. Furthermore, the hunt for Laundry at the Carlton Reserve was scaled back after a 10-day search with no sign of Brian. On September 28th, a press conference was held in Bohemia, New York with Gabby's parents. The Petito attorney spoke directly to Brian. For Brian, we're asking you to turn yourself into the FBI or the nearest law enforcement agency. On September 29th, Dog headed out with boat crews, ground teams, and rescue dogs to the island surrounding Fort DeSoto Park. We're out here at the island. This would be and could be a perfect spot for him to hide. Uh, not too many people out here, but there's a lot of environmental things that we're going to fight. So here we go. The search now is really on. The search has just begun. Dog continued to ask the public to send in tips and reassured everyone that he and his team will not reveal information that will jeopardize the case. Later that day, Fox News shared a photo of a monster energy drink that was found by Dog during their island hops. It's unclear if the drink belonged to Brian. 
In the morning of October 2nd, Dennis Davis, a Florida engineer, claimed he spoke to Brian on a deserted road near the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina. Dennis told the New York Post, There's no doubt in my mind I spoke to Brian Laundrie. Dog the Bounty Hunter's daughter sent me an audio file of Brian's voice, and the voice was the same I heard. Dennis said the Brian lookalike appeared dazed when he waved down Dennis at Waterville Road to ask for directions to California using only back roads. Dennis suggested taking Interstate 40, but the man refused. Dennis asked the Brian lookalike what he was trying to find, and he allegedly responded, Me and my girlfriend got in a fight, but she called me, told me she loves me, and I have to get to California to see her. What's interesting to note is Brian has lived in the Appalachians before, by himself for months, according to Rose, Gabby's best friend. Dennis said his three calls to the FBI and 911 have not been returned, but he understands they are probably getting many tips on Brian's whereabouts. On October 3rd, Dog the Bounty Hunter decided to work on Dennis's tip and search near the Appalachian Trail. On October 5th, Brian's sister Cassie spoke to News Nation and clarified she doesn't know if her parents are involved in Brian's disappearance and doesn't know if Brian ended Gabby's life. She said both Brian and their parents have not been speaking to her and she was just as baffled and blown away as everybody else at her parents' silence so far. Cassie said she cooperated with authorities and told them everything she does know, adding she was advised not to speak to anybody about the situation. In another interview with Good Morning America, Cassie had a public message for Brian. I would tell my brother to just come forward and get us out of this horrible mess. Cassie said she wished things had happened differently. I really wish he had come to me first that day with the van because I don't think we'd be here. On October 6th, Dog's daughter, Cecily Chapman, spoke to the son about her father. He needs to back off and let the FBI handle it. It's just a publicity stunt. Cecily questioned how Dog was financing his hunt for Brian and claimed Dog was allegedly trying to get a new reality TV show. Cecily also brought up the video Dog shared waist deep in the water and said, It looks totally staged. So it's unclear how honest Dog's reports are going forward. On October 12th, Teton County Coroner Dr. Brent Blue announced to the public Gabby's cause of death was homicide by asphyxiation. Dr. Blue also added he does not know the exact time and date of death. It's still unclear who the potential suspect is. On the night of October 19th, the Laundry parents informed FBI and Northport Police that they wanted to join the search for their son Brian at the Carlton Reserve, the last location Brian told his parents he would be traveling to in mid-September. The next day, on October 20th, the Laundry parents arrived at the search location and directed authorities to the Micahatchee Creek Environmental Park, which is connected to the Carlton Reserve. Within 30 minutes of their search, Brian's dad, Chris Laundry, discovered a familiar white bag and a dark object. In a video captured by Fox News, Chris walked through a patch of bushes while Roberta stood motionless on the trail, staring off into the opposite direction. The video then cut to Chris holding the white bag while talking to Roberta. Police were not within earshot. They were seen putting a dark object inside the bag before handing it to the officers. In a later report from the Laundry's lawyer, Chris initially did didn't want to pick up the bag because he wanted law enforcement to see it. Their lawyer added, Chris couldn't find the law enforcement because they were then out of sight, because Chris had been in the woods, so he didn't want to leave the bag there with the news reporter standing nearby, so he picked it up. The laundry's lawyer also said Chris called authorities to inform them about their find. Their lawyer said Chris and Roberta looked into the bag. When officers showed up to retrieve the white bag, they also showed Chris and Roberta a photo of a different bag they found, belonging to Brian. The white bag found by the laundry parents was dry while the backpack found by police is believed to have been previously underwater. The laundries were then asked to leave the park as investigators continued searching the area. The FBI and investigators later found a notebook and clothing belonging to Brian believed to have been previously underwater. Northport police say Brian's notebook may be salvageable, but did not clarify if there is any legible writing inside of it. Either way, this is a key item for any potential clues surrounding the case. Then, the case took a devastating turn. Near Brian's personal items, they found skeletal remains, which include a portion of a human skull, also believed to have been previously underwater. Northport police said the remains were found about two to three miles outside the Carlton Reserve, or about a 45-minute walk from the entrance at Mayakachi Creek Environmental Park. People had a lot to say about Chris and Roberta's behavior during the search. Father appears to not be searching, but heading right to a particular point. Wow. And the mom is just casually wandering and not even looking. It's so wild. Every rule of evidence collection was broken. On October 21st, FBI said dental records confirmed the identification of the remains as Brian's. Despite the tragic news, people were not afraid to voice their suspicions about Brian's parents. So the FBI and Dog the Bounty Hunter couldn't find Brian Laundry for two months, but his parents find his body in 30 minutes. Something smells fishy here.
Brian Laundrie's parents are like, have you tried checking this spot? The one he definitely didn't tell us he'd be at? Maybe he's in the lake, haha. That lake right there. Look in the lake. This doesn't explain why his remains was skeletonized in such a short time, less than five weeks. Even in the worst conditions in open environment, it's impossible. However, it wouldn't be surprising if the environment played a part in Brian's passing. The park he was found in has chest-high waters and are filled with hungry wetland animals such as poisonous snakes, alligators, palmetto bugs, swarms of mosquitoes, and wild pigs. In fact, John Wildman, a man who lives near the reserve and often walks there, said, there's alligators, but the worst thing are the wild pigs. They're evil animals and will eat anything. Any flesh out in the open will not be wasted. There won't be much for the coroner to work on. Nature doesn't waste anything. Furthermore, there was flooding at the reserve from early to late September, around the time Brian went missing. But even with this information, people were still unsure. Kyle Hayen, a canine handler and former police officer, said, It's highly suspicious that cadaver dogs may have missed the remains during their search. If the body had been there when they went by with cadaver dogs, and the body had been there for more than two or three minutes, the odor would have come through the water. They should have been able to locate that body. Many people continue to express their concern with the possibility of the evidence being planted. This was staged. The remains just stayed there right next to the backpack. None of it floated or moved. Sus. Who believes that Brian Laundrie's dad planted the new found evidence? He was alone when he found it, not within eyesight of any officers. Isn't this just way too convenient? After all these months and hundreds of people searching that exact area, nothing found before. There is something really wrong with this whole investigation of Brian and his family. Why are law enforcement so inept? Why were they able to contaminate a crime scene? I don't think it's him. I think it's another staged event by parents' attorney and Brian. I keep saying Northport needs an investigation of corruption. The parents seem to have connections or something. This whole thing is shady and seems like a setup to get the media off Northport police and laundries. The laundries lawyer has since described these theories as maddening, ludicrous, and bullshit. On October 25th, the Laundry's lawyer announced the initial autopsy on the remains was inconclusive, meaning they could not determine the manner and cause of death. Their lawyer said the remains were sent to an anthropologist for further evaluation. For context, there are ways to extract DNA from skeletal remains, however, it may take a bit more time to do this. There were many theories people had about Brian and Gabby as the investigation went on. Theory 1. Gabby may have signaled for help, according to some TikTokers. Now, right there. Guys, she really did do this for a quick second. This is a signal for help. A signal for help. It's a one-handed gesture that women and children and men as well can use on a video call or in person to communicate that they feel threatened. It's the alternative to calling 911 and sends a signal to anyone, the police, a family member, a friend, please reach out to me safely. Fox 10 News later reported on this theory, causing it to gain traction. Unfortunately, there is no way of knowing what Gabby really meant. Theory 2. Brian's personal interest may hint at something more sinister, according to some people on Instagram. A couple of months before the couple left for their cross-country trip, Brian shared many disturbing images and artwork to his Instagram and Pinterest accounts. Brian also enjoyed adding blood to his artwork. In one art piece, Brian wrote, Grim Reaper leading the sheep to the slaughter and a mousetrap. Brian also shared photos photos and captions about many of Chuck Palahniuk's books. One person was specifically concerned with the book Lullaby. Her fiancé seems slightly obsessed with Chuck Palahniuk's work. The photo on his page with Lullaby is haunting, especially knowing the book has been summarized as a dark black humor plumed into a road trip that swings some curves with the unlikeliest of partners on a mission. In another post, Brian insulted people who spend too much time in front of screens, and someone thought he may have been taking jabs at Gabby because of her new travel blog. This is another concerning post. Literally tells the story of insulting Gabby's media presence, then the mouth of his princess? These are very dark thoughts he was having towards her way before he Wow, I haven't seen this on the news. Someone else shared their thoughts on fan art Brian created for the video game Hotline Miami, a game about mysterious clues people in tagged locations. It's really very eerie. Many people also noticed disturbing photos Brian saved to his Pinterest page. In one saved album called Things to Burn Off, Brian saved sketches of ghosts, skeletons, and tattoos. Some of the tattoos in the album match tattoos Gabby and Brian have. It's unclear what this means. One particular drawing showed a gravestone with My Baby written on it. A ghost-looking figure also says, Let her go, let her go, God bless her, wherever she may be. In another saved album called My Heart, Brian saved several eerie quotes such as, The opposite of lost, 
don't try to find me. I have finally escaped my master's wicked clutches. To the others I say, join me, bite the hand that feeds you. So why did he leave me here alone? Cause you scare. You too, birdie girl. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. Nyctophilia, love of darkness or night, finding relaxation or comfort in the darkness. Oh no, he lives. Brian also shared quotes that seem to suggest personal or romantic relationship issues. Did I do something wrong? Why won't you talk to me? Where'd you go? Did I mess up? Should I apologize? Am I bothering you? What did I do? Sorry? Are you busy? Is it my fault? Are you okay? What happened? Mind says, move on. Heart says, hold on. In another saved album called Bleak, Brian saved a drawing of a woman laying on the grass with marks on her body. There's no way of knowing if Brian's taste in art is related to his suspicious behavior. This is a heart-wrenching case, and now that the person of interest has passed, many questions are left unanswered. What happened between the pair that seemed to be so in love? Was their wedding really put on hold because of the pandemic? Gabby's best friend Rose suggested Gabby and Brian's relationship may not have been as loving as we thought. I do believe that their relationship as they kept going on was getting a little yeah, problematic. Gabby's family may never get the closure they need, and Brian's parents are now facing the consequences of their son's suspicious behavior. There are a lot of theories floating around, and while anything is possible, it's still best to wait for more concrete evidence before forming any conclusions about the case. If you have any relevant information to the case, you can call 1-800-CALL-FBI or 303-629-7171. Information can be submitted at tips.fbi.gov, and photos and videos can be uploaded to fbi.gov slash petito. Until further information is discovered, the reasons behind Gabby's and Brian's deaths remain unsolved.